Living cells are highly organized complex systems that consist of numerous molecular machines that perform any number of functions. Furthermore, these molecular machines are indispensable to cellular function and maintenance. There are three main types of cells. Each has their unique qualities. Some have components the others lack, but they all have some components in common. Prokaryotic cells, which are single-celled organisms only, like bacteria, they have no nucleus and no mitochondria, and they include the simplest living cells. Plant cells, which contain chlorophyll that allows them to absorb solar energy. Animal cells, which have no cell wall, making them flexible. They are found in animals and people. Next, we will look at some examples of cellular machinery that are important to cellular function. They copy, manufacture, and transport. Without them, cells could not repair themselves or reproduce. First of all, DNA does not actually self-replicate. Copying DNA takes several molecular machines. They unwind it, they separate it, transcribe it, and rewind it. Yet another molecular machine is used for transposing DNA information into RNA. It separates the DNA, transposes the information to the RNA, and then reconnects the DNA. A ribosome is a molecular machine that uses the RNA to manufacture proteins on demand. Another molecular machine then folds the protein strand that is produced into the exact shape needed for its job. Motor proteins carry proteins to where they are needed in bags called vesicles. The motor proteins carry the vesicle by walking along microtubules. These molecular machines are just the tip of the cellular molecular machine iceberg. The result is that living cells have a degree of order and complexity seen no place else except in the human mind. Such a degree of order and complexity means that living cells have an extremely low entropy. The problem is that since the simplest known living cell is far more organized and complex than the basic chemical components that make up a cell, a living cell's entropy is much, 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 much lower than that of their basic chemical components. As a result, forming life from non-living chemicals requires a tremendous reduction in entropy. So any theory on the origin of life must be able to account for this tremendous reduction in entropy. The possible options boil down to two possibilities. A. Biogenesis and creation by an intelligence from outside our universe, that is, a supernatural intelligence. The possibility that life originated on another planet has been proposed. However, this does not actually explain the origin of life. It only moves it to another planet. The question is, which of the two possibilities best fits the laws of thermodynamics? The totally naturalistic notion of abiogenesis or a supernatural intelligence? Statistical entropy is the application of probability theory to the thermodynamic principle of entropy. It shows that entropy is a measure of the amount of disorder in a system. The number of equivalent microstates, or the number of possible ways for a given condition to occur, is denoted as omega. In this formula, entropy is denoted as S. K is the Boltzmann constant. This results in the formula of S equals K times the natural logarithm of omega. This shows that entropy is a measure of the disorder of a system. Disordered systems have a greater number of equivalent microstates than ordered systems. The larger omega is, the more disordered the system is. Consequently, the smaller omega is, the more ordered the system is. As a result, the larger a system's entropy, the more disordered it is. And the smaller a system's entropy, the more ordered it is. Reducing entropy requires more than just applying energy. It depends on how the energy is applied. Energy applied to a system in a manner more ordered than that system's degree of order increases the system's degree of order. Energy applied to a system in a manner more disordered than that system's degree of disorder increases the system's disorder. The mathematical relationship for this is shown by the number of equivalent microstates of the applied energy is omega sub e. The number of initial equivalent microstates of the system is omega sub s. The change in entropy is denoted as delta s. K is the Boltzmann constant. This results in delta s max equaling k times the natural logarithm of omega e over omega s. The value delta s sub max denotes the change in entropy that occurs if the energy is applied to the entire system with 100% efficiency. 
This shows the general direction that applying energy to a system will move the entropy of that system. The actual change in entropy results from the amount of energy actually applied to the system. This principle can be reduced to two statements. The general application of energy to a system in a manner more random than the system will increase the entropy of that system. And the general application of energy to a system in a manner less random than that system will decrease the entropy of that system. Any theory on the origin of life must raise the prebiotic chemical's degree of order and complexity to that of the simplest living cell. To do this, it must apply energy to the system in a manner at least as organized and complex as the simplest living cell. To illustrate this, let's take a frog and a blender. Put the frog in the blender and turn it on. In a matter of seconds, you will have a blender filled with all of the chemical components needed to make a frog in the form of frog knives. The frog was converted by the blender into frog nog. Now, the entropy of the frog nog is much, much greater than the entropy of a frog. However, to get life from non-life, you have to turn the frog nog back into a frog, or at least turn frog nog into a single-cell bacterium. However, the entropy of the frog nog is still much, much greater than the entropy of a single-cell bacterium. The usual explanation is that cells started out simpler, that is, without the cellular machinery. There are several problems with this idea. No such organism exists. It is totally ad hoc. The hypothetical cells would still need to acquire the cellular machinery to become today's cells. There is no natural way to produce cellular machinery without cellular machinery. Without cellular machinery to repair itself, a cell's entropy would quickly increase and it would die. Another problem with this simplified cell idea is that the order from this order principle is path independent. In other words, it does not matter how you get from point A to point B. The results are the same. So adding hypothetical stages does not change the results. What is needed is to evaluate all of the phenomena that can add energy to prebiotic chemicals or hypothetical protocells. What follows is just such an evaluation. Heat is one source of energy available for prebiotic chemicals and protocells. So let's heat up a frog knot. However, heat applies energy to a system in a random manner. In fact, it is more random than the frog knot or any other prebiotic soup. The result is that you cook the frog knot. This means mathematically that omega heat is greater than omega frog knot. This means that omega E equals omega heat and omega s equals omega frog nog. Now applying this to the formula for the change in entropy from applied energy, and we get that delta s max is greater than zero, so that the frog nog's entropy increases. The heat will tend to break down organic chemicals rather than produce them. Expose any organism to enough heat and you will kill it. Now some are more resistant than others, but they all have limits. Heat is clearly not capable of making life from non-life. Radiation is one source of energy available to prebiotic chemicals or protocells. So let's take a microwave oven and, and put our frog nog in it, close the door, and turn it on. Now, radiation applies energy to a system in a random manner. In fact, it is more random than the frog nog or any other prebiotic soup. The actual result is that you cook the frog nog because most of the radiation is converted into heat. The result is that omega radiation is greater than omega frog nog. Omega E equals omega radiation, and omega S equals omega frog nog. Now applying this to the formula for the change in entropy from applied energy, and we get that delta S max is greater than zero, so that the frog nog's entropy increases. The simple fact is that radiation tends to break down organic animals rather than to produce them. Expose any organism to enough radiation, including roaches, and you will kill it. Now, some are more resistant than others, but they all have their limits. Radiation is clearly not capable of making life from non-life. Electrical energy is one source of energy available to prebiotic chemicals or protocells in the form of lightning. So let's take a frog nod and put it out in a thunderstorm and let it get struck by lightning. However, while electricity applies energy to a system in a less random manner than heat and radiation, it is still more random than frog knock or any other possible prebiotic soup. In fact, most of the energy gets converted into heat with a small amount of chemical reactions, most of which are not in the direction towards life. The result is that you cook the frog knock and break it down further. The result is that omega electricity is greater than omega frog knock.
where omega E equals omega electricity and omega S equals omega prognog. Now applying this to the formula for the change in entropy from applied energy, then we get that delta S max is greater than zero, so that the prognog's entropy increases. Electrical energy tends to break down organic chemicals rather than produce them. This is supported by the famed Miller-Urey experiment of 1953, where the electrical spark tended to destroy amino acids once they were made. As a result, the experiment required a trap to keep the products from going back through the apparatus so as to preserve the amino acids that were formed. The simple fact is lightning striking a living organism kills the organism. Electrical energy is clearly not capable of making life from non-life. Solar energy is one source of energy available for prebiotic chemicals or protocells. In fact, it is the most commonly suggested source of energy suggested for the origin of life. So let's take our frog nog and put it outside with the sun pouring on it without chlorophyll in the accompanying cellular machinery. There is no mechanism to convert the solar energy into useful energy. So without these mechanisms, solar energy gets applied to the system in a random manner, with most of what is absorbed becoming heat. The result is that the frog nog will decay and eventually sink. This decay will happen even if it is not exposed to bacteria, it will just be slower. The point is that omega solar energy is greater than omega frog nog, with omega E equaling omega solar energy, and omega S equals omega frog nog. Now applying this to the formula for the change in entropy from applied energy, and we get that delta S max is greater than zero, so that the frog nog's entropy increases. Without chlorophyll and the accompanying cellular machinery, solar energy tends to break down organic chemicals rather than produce them. This is particularly true of ultraviolet light, exposure to which can cause cancer. The simple fact is that solar energy is clearly not capable of making life from non-life. Chemistry is one source of energy available for prebiotic chemicals or protocells. Unlike the others, Chemistry can increase the order of a system, thereby reducing its entropy. It does not necessarily do so, but increasing or decreasing entropy depends upon the reaction. It can also use the other sources of energy to either increase or decrease entropy. There are two main ways that chemistry can reduce entropy. One way is by reducing the number of free particles. This reduces the number of equivalent configurations. It is effectively reducing the size of the system. The other way is that chemical bonds have a geometric order to how they form, so they can produce a degree of order in the atoms. This geometric order most often tends to form simple repetitive patterns like those found in crystals. However, carbon chemistry can form some complex molecules even without light. As a result, it is safe to conclude that chemistry can apply energy in a manner more ordered than frog nog or any prebiotic soup. This means that omega chem min is less than omega prognog, such that omega E equals omega chem min, and omega S equals omega prognog. Now applying this to the formula for the change in entropy from applied energy, then we get delta S max is less than zero. As a result, the prognog entropy can decrease. It needs to be noted that this is not guaranteed, just possible. Furthermore, the larger and more complex organic compounds become, the more unstable they become. That is that they tend to break down quickly after they are formed. So the question is, can chemistry produce life? That is, does chemistry have sufficient organization to produce life from non-life? The answer is no, because life is more than just chemistry. This is because even the simplest living cell is a complex assembly of information and molecular machines that manufactures, transports, and manipulates large complex molecules as it needs them. Mathematically, this becomes omega chem min is greater than omega cell, such that omega E equals omega chem min, and omega S equals omega cell. Now applying this to the formula for the change in entropy from applied energy, then we get that delta S max is greater than zero. As a result, the cell's entropy will increase based only on chemistry. The result is that by itself, chemistry is not sufficient to produce life from non-life. It is at this point that proponents of abiogenesis pull out their ultimate weapon that in their eyes fixes all problems. And this ultimate weapon is 
Natural selection. Natural selection is pulled out and waved over the problem like a magic wand. And once invoked, magically fixes all problems, eventually being able to turn frognog back into a frog. Natural selection is the process by which environmental conditions, nature, determine, that is select, how well particular traits of an organism can serve survival and reproduction. The result is that those variations with traits that best serve survival and reproduction have more kids and their traits spread throughout the population. It is a form of natural selective breeding. A key point of natural selection is that it works only on populations of living organisms. That means it only works on life, which makes it no help whatsoever with regards to producing life from non-life. The usual response is that maybe life started out simpler than it currently is. That is, that life started out without the current molecular machinery. There are several problems with this notion. No such life exists, and no evidence for it exists. It is a totally ad hoc invention. Without cellular machinery, there is no way to read DNA or even RNA so as to manufacture needed proteins on demand. Furthermore, no reading mechanism also means that DNA or RNA cannot pass on newly acquired traits to offspring. This makes them totally useless. Furthermore, without cellular machinery, there is no way for a cell to accurately repair itself, and its entropy will increase and eventually kill it. Assuming that these hypothetical cells did exist, getting from there to existing cells still requires a tremendous reduction in entropy. Somehow the hypothetical cell would have to acquire cellular machinery without the cellular machinery that produces them. So the question at hand is, can natural selection do the job? The problem is that natural selection does not actually produce anything. It only selects from traits that already exist, those traits that are best for survival and reproduction in a given environment. As a result, natural selection applies no energy to a system, and so it cannot reduce entropy. So without any way for the hypothetical simple cell to acquire cellular machinery, natural selection has nothing to work on. The only remaining possibility would be if natural selection were a sufficiently ordered process that its selection would tend toward decreasing entropy. This would require it to behave like a genetic algorithm. Genetic algorithms are complex computer program routines that use trial and error to work towards a predetermined goal, even if the exact outcome is not predetermined. These computer routines have several features that make them work. Random mutation of data sets, a pre-programmed objective that is used to determine the survival and copying of a given data set. All possible configurations can survive as long as they are closest to the goal. While natural selection inspired genetic algorithms, it lacks the very property that gives genetic algorithms their power. It does use random mutation of data sets, genes, but that's where the similarities end. It has no pre-programmed objective that is used to determine survival and copying, since its only goal is survival and copying. There are genetic configurations in living cells that are always fatal. This means that natural selection is not a sufficiently ordered process for decreasing entropy. The problem is amplified by the fact that without cellular machinery, a hypothetical simple cell cannot read genetic information so offspring cannot get new traits from their parents. The result is that natural selection cannot overcome the thermodynamic barrier to developing existing cellular machinery. This means that natural selection is clearly not capable of making life from non-life. We have examined every way that energy could be applied to non-living matter and even a hypothetical, overly simplified cell. They are heat, radiation, electrical energy, solar energy, and chemistry. Heat, radiation, electrical energy, and solar energy all prove to be more random than the frog knock or any potential prebiotic soup. As a result, they would increase the entropy of the prebiotic suit and not the enormous decrease that is needed for abiogenesis. On the other hand, chemistry has a degree of order to it because of the geometry of chemical bonds. As a result, it can decrease the entropy of a prebiotic suit, but still falls short of the degree of ordered complexity of the simplest living cell. Apogenesis's last hope is natural selection. However, natural selection cannot lead to the origin of life since it only works on life. 
The proposed solution is simpler cells without cellular machinery. However, proposing simpler cells without cellular machinery does not solve the problem. Cells would be killed by rapidly increasing entropy without cellular machinery. Furthermore, natural selection is not an organized process that can decrease entropy. The conclusion is that abiogenesis is a thermodynamic impossibility. Living organisms have both the internally stored information and cellular machinery needed to produce other life. Individual cells have the internally stored information and cellular machinery needed to produce other cells of the same kind. Multicellular organisms have the internally stored information and cellular machinery needed to produce other multicellular organisms of the same kind. Each organism has the ability to apply energy to the raw materials of life with a degree of order of complexity needed to produce life of the same kind. The fact is that the only observed way of producing life is for it to be produced by life. So life can produce life from non-life. We have seen that life can create new life. In fact, it is the only observed source of life. But the ultimate origin of biological life cannot be biological life since no cell can make itself. There is one known phenomenon that has sufficient ordered complexity to apply energy in a manner of sufficient ordered complexity to produce life. That phenomenon is intelligence. The human mind has a higher degree of ordered complexity than living cells. This is true even if the mind is just a part of the brain, since the brain consists of billions of cells wired in a complex ordered network. The fact is that the human mind regularly produces forms of ordered complexity. Scientists have encoded an artificial genome and successfully implanted it into a living cell, thus proving that intelligence can encode a cell's genome. It is not unreasonable to think that unless life on a single cell level requires a spiritual component, the humans will one day develop the technology to artificially build a living cell from scratch. So a high enough intelligence would be capable of producing life from non-life. This means that the only known phenomenon that could have originated biological life is intelligence. But can intelligence exist without biological life? There is evidence that suggests the answer is yes. According to every major religion in the world, except atheism, there is a human soul that survives the death of the body. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam believe in a god without a physical body. Most religions have intelligent spirit beings of one form or another that exist without physical body. The mere universal nature of these beliefs suggests they are more than fight the fantasy. More direct evidence comes from the form of near-death experiences in which the person reports things they could not have known about that are confirmed to be real. There are also sightings and photographs of ghosts, some of which suggest an intelligence. Granted, these do not qualify as hard scientific evidence. There is still more evidence than exists for abiogenesis, which is absolutely nothing. However, there is scientific evidence suggesting that intelligence can exist apart from biological life. It is from a paper published in the Journal of Neuroquantology called Synaptic Quantum Tunneling in Brain Activity, as showing that synaptic functions require quantum tunneling on demand. This quantum tunneling on demand requires the mind to control the process. As a result, the mind cannot be purely a product of the brain because the brain could not function if the mind was dependent on the quantum tunneling it needs to control. As a result, there has to be a degree of separation between the mind and the brain. As a result, the intelligence of the human mind must exist independent of the biological life that has it. Intelligence also fits the Sherlock Holmes axiom. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Having shown abiogenesis to be impossible, intelligence is all that remains, so it must be the truth. Furthermore, since the universe had a beginning, this intelligence had to be from outside the universe. An intelligence from outside the universe would exist outside of time and thus could be eternal. This intelligence would, by definition, be supernatural. This intelligence would also, by definition, be the being we call God. There is really only one reason for dismissing this answer, and that reason is a prior commitment to the philosophy of naturalism. Naturalism discounts all but totally naturalistic explanations for all phenomena has a starting assumption. As a result, someone with a prior commitment to naturalism cannot accept any intelligent explanation for the origin of life. Given its thermodynamic problem, there is really only one reason to believe in abiogenesis, and that reason is a prior commitment to the philosophy of naturalism. Naturalism discounts all but totally naturalistic explanations for all phenomena has a starting assumption. 
As a result, someone with a prior commitment to naturalism must accept their biogenesis, regardless of the evidence. This is because naturalism allows no other possibility, because some form of a biogenesis is the only real naturalistic option. So if you hold to naturalism, you have to believe in abiogenesis, even if it requires violating every known law of science. Having demonstrated that abiogenesis is a thermodynamic impossibility, it can no longer be considered a rational scientific theory of the origin of life. Since the only possibility that fits with thermodynamic principles is an intelligence from outside the space-time of our universe, this means that the real rational scientific theory of the origin of life is creation by a supernatural intelligence. By definition, God.